we continue our study in the book of Daniel uh, this morning. And keep your Bibles open as we'll read the Scriptures as we go. And we stopped abruptly last week calling for us to be a Daniel. To be a Daniel in the home, to be a Daniel in the church, to be a Daniel at work, wherever we are, to be a Daniel. And remember that the wicked king Belshazzar threw a big party, had a thousand guests, the wine was poured, the, the women arrived, and Belshazzar called for the holy golden vessels from Jerusalem that had previously been used in the worship of the Lord to be brought out for this wild party in Babylon. Everyone is having a great time in their sin on this night. Drunkenness, sexual orgies, desecrating God's special cups, but suddenly a hand appears and a finger begins to write a mysterious message on the wall in the banquet hall. Belshazzar calls for the magicians, as you remember, who couldn't read the writing, and most likely his grandmother, who suggests, call upon Daniel. Uh, he'll be able to help you with this message. And, and as I have mentioned before, Daniel is some 80 plus years old now, and he comes in to decipher the message for this troubled king. Trouble is brutal, and judgment is coming for Belshazzar. And what I have not told you up to this point is this. While Belshazzar part in his past, his enemies were encamped around Babylon. But King Belshazzar believed that Babylon was safe. Remember, they had enough food stored up for some 20 years. So there's plenty of food. No worries. They, the Euphrates River bisected the city, so there's water. Babylon was surrounded by a series of walls, some as wide as 87 feet and as tall as 350 feet. So no worries. It's what Belshazzar is saying. Furthermore, Belshazzar most likely knew that. And uh, he threw this uh, part knowing that the enemy was approaching. And if you recall Nabonidus, who was Belshazzar's father, and Belshazzar, the son, actually were co-rulers during this time. Nabonidus was in Arabia. Belshazzar, who was the son, was to take care of things in Babylon. And the Persians had attacked Nabonidus north of Babylon and caused him to retreat. So Belshazzar is aware that the Persians are on the march. But he feels secure there in the palace. He feels that Babylon is uncomfortable. He was not worried about the Persians coming at all. In his cockiness and in his pride, he threw a party and invited a thousand big shots. Perhaps he had a great feast so that everyone would take their mind off of the enemy just outside the walls. And to illustrate how confident that he was that everything was going to be okay. Instead of holding a cup of wine on this night, the king should have grabbed a sword. This king was living the lifestyle of eat, drink, and be merry. And oh, how this describes society as a whole today. Partying while the enemy is just outside the walls. Many today think that the best response to impending danger, the best response to trouble, the best response to worry is to forget about it and escape into a pursuit of pleasure. They carry on through life as though it will never end. They seek pleasure for the body. They seek drugs to alter the mind. They seek booze to forget their misery and destructive relationship after relationship after relationship with li which leaves them empty and depressed. Belshazzar's actions reminds me of the rich farmer Jesus told about in Luke chapter 12 who had done so well his fields had yielded so much that uh, he said, my barns are all full. And he thought to himself, I have laid up for many years so I can take it easy. I can eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to this rich farmer, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. You see, Belshazzar had crossed the line when he met with the holy things of God, golden vessels that had been used in the temple and sat in that holy place were now filled with the king's wine and being passed around to these drunk men and women passed around like a basketball. You don't mess with the things of God and get away with it. Belshazzar, you've gone too far and the end is near. Belshazzar, you are about to experience the wrath of Almighty God. You'll regret today, Belshazzar, that you toasted to your false gods and began to talk the Lord God Almighty, the God of Daniel. Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be 
required of thee, Belshazzar. Now that the city has been set, the king has summoned Daniel to interpret the right on the law. Let's look at the scriptures beginning with verse 13. Verse 13 of Daniel chapter 5. And we'll move quickly. It says, Then was Daniel brought in before the king, and the king spake and said unto Daniel, Art thou that Daniel which art of the children of the captivity of Judah, whom the king my father brought out of Jerusalem? There's sort of a hint here of Belshazzar's pride. Like that of his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar, if you recall, over the last couple of months. He sort of belittles Daniel in front of the crowd. He says, aren't you the same Daniel that my granddaddy captured and brought over from Judah? I don't know, by the way, what this kingdom would have been all these years had Daniel not been there to help. But then after his comment, in verses 14 through 16, he understands that Daniel is full of wisdom. Daniel has insight that the Spirit of God is in him. And he explains in verse 15 to Daniel that his wise men were not able they were not successful in interpreting the right on the wall. He then offers Daniel the same reward if he is able to interpret this writing on the wall. To be clothed in scarlet, to have a golden chain around his neck, and to be the third ruler in the kingdom. Remember, we have Nabonidus, we have Belshazzar, and that would, of course, leave Daniel as the third ruler of the kingdom. And that's what he promises to whoever can interpret the writing on the wall. And the world would have wanted these rewards with a passion. But Daniel declines. He says, you keep them or give them to someone else in verse 17. And then in verses 18 through 23, Daniel picks up a spiritual bazooka and he points it at Daniel and he shoots him right between the eyes. Daniel begins to speak with no key. He speaks with no effort to dilute the truth. Often kings back then would execute those who spoke bad news before them. But Daniel is not afraid to tell the truth. He speaks with no apologies to this king who has mocked. Holy God, Daniel pulled out his sword and he let that sharp edge cut deep. And folks, we need to do more of that ourselves. We need to pull out this sword, the Word of God. And we know in the book of Hebrews, it tells us, for the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharp than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and joints them out as a discerner in the thoughts and intents of the heart. Daniel tells Belshazzar, you know, Belshazzar, your grandfather Nebuchadnezzar ruled for many years. The Most High God gave your grandfather Nebuchadnezzar this great kingdom of Babylon. All the people feared him, Belshazzar. He could promote who he wanted to promote, and he could execute those that he wanted to kill. But Belshazzar, I know, I want you to know that your grandfather became proud. Your grandfather became arrogant in his position of authority, exalting himself above everyone else and not giving praise to the Lord. He did not give God the glory. And because of this, Belshazzar, your grandfather Nebuchadnezzar was removed from the royal throne and he was placed in the fields like a beast, to live as a beast, if you recall, on all fours with, with claws and eating the grass of the field. And he was humbled. And finally, and he acknowledged God. Can you picture Belshazzar now as old Daniel is speaking to him? He's just been told and reminded of his grandfather's pride and resistance to bow before the Lord. <clears throat> and he must be sensing his own pride now. Look at verse 22. What Daniel tells Belshazzar. He says, And thou his son, or his grandson, O Belshazzar, has not humbled thy heart, though thou knewest all this. Daniel says, Belshazzar, as Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, you too have not humbled your heart, and you knew all of this about your granddad. Belshazzar, you knew of your grandfather's experiences. You knew all of that. Belshazzar knew the truth. Instead of bowing before the Lord, as Nebuchadnezzar finally did in his old age, Belshazzar will not humble his heart. He refuses to believe the truth. And he lifts up his fist and shakes his fist at the face of God in heaven. He ignored the word of God. And the only thing that he is done. I wonder about you this morning. Are you ignoring the word of God? 
God? Are you ignoring the call of God? Has God placed you in a position of influence? If so, you're not there by your own might. You're not there because you're smart. You're not there because you're strong. He helped you get there. You give Him the glory. You give Him the credit. You yield to Him and you'll, or either you'll find yourself in a situation like Belshazzar. The right will be on the wall. So summing up what Dan tells Belshazzar. He says, you worship lifeless objects instead of the one who holds your life in his hand. Now, that same hand is about to take everything from you that you've been boasting of all these years. And folks, the same will happen to you. The same will happen to you. You can praise God. You can give Him glory. You can thank Him for all your blessings. Or you can boast about what you think you've accomplished. And you can keep sweating. You can keep working and thinking all of it's yours. And you'll find yourself similar to Belshazzar's life. You'll find your life similar to the rich farmer that has stored up so much material. that a fool this night my soul shall be required of thee. So the choice is yours. You can praise God, thank Him for your blessings, or you can live to the day that you regret it. It's Bill Shazer did. It's this rich farmer did. Your life, my life, your family's life, my family's life is in His hands, not in my hands. And your life's not in your hands. It's in His hands. It's in His hands. What have you done about your eternal soul? What have you done to help your children prepare for eternity? Are you, are they prepared to meet the maker? Don't ignore the warnings of God. Don't neglect the Word of God. This is the truth. Don't let it be said to you on Judgment Day. You knew all about this. You knew all about it. But you would not humble your heart. Daniel made sure Belshazzar knew the truth. And I hope that you understand. Sometimes we'll say, why do you get up there and holler and scream? I want you to know the truth. I don't want it to be said of you one day, you knew all of this. You did like Belshazzar. You refused to listen. But here's the message. I think we have a slide. Here's the words that were on the wall. The message is so disturbing. That looks like an eye test uh, for those who have ever had to do those before. Here's the message. Anyone tell me what it says? Can anybody read it? Well, uh, it was most likely in Arabic, Hebrew. And you read that from right to left. Instead of left to right. You read it backwards. And the reader must supply the vowels. So if you look in verse 25 of your Bible, leave this up there by the way, but in verse 25 of your Bible, you read from right to left, you'll find the words Manet, Manet, to call you Farson. So it would be M-E-N-E M-E-N-E-T-E-K-E-L U-P-H-A-R-S-I-N those are the words. This was the message that was so disturbing to the king and the people other than the fact that a hand out of nowhere appears and begins to write. But no wonder the magicians were stumped. They didn't know how to read it. They didn't know how to read it. And let's see what this means, the interpretation of it. In verse 26, Daniel begins to interpret what these words me. In verse 26 it says, this is the interpretation of the thing. Manet, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Verse 27, to call, thou art weighed in the mountains and art found wanting. For us, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. And the first one, Manet, comes from a word which means to number. A verb which means to number. The interpretation from Daniel is that God has numbered the days for existence of the Babylonian kingdom and was about to bring it to an end. Belshazzar's number was up. 
Secondly, to call comes from a verb which means to what? And the interpretation given by Daniel to the king is that the king had been what? He had been evaluated by God and has been found wanting. You picture a balance right now. This would be even. You put some heavy. You see what I'm saying? So this would be Belshazzar. He's found lacking. He's found too light. Belshazzar's weight is too light. He did not measure up to God's standard of righteousness. God's standard of righteousness is here. Belshazzar's here. And the scale goes like this. And then we have Pharos. The word used in verse 25 is Eupharsa, which is a combination of two words indicating the destruction and division of Babylon. And the word comes from that verb Pharos that we just read as well, which means to divide. And then you have Pharsin, which means the Persians. So the kingdom was to be broken up or divided to be conquered by the Persians. How many of you remember, it's been a few months, I hope a few of you can remember, how many of you a few months ago remember me talking about Nebuchadnezzar's dream back in Daniel chapter 2? He had a disturbing dream. There was a, an image, a statue, it had a golden head. Anybody remember that? There was a statue, some of you remember, there was a golden head. And if you recall, the statue had a golden head. It had silver. It had silver chest, silver arms. It had a brass, bronze belly, thighs. And then it went down to iron in the legs. And then in the feet, remember, there was clay. Part clay, part iron. If you remember that statue, and this was disturbing to Nebuchadnezzar. He didn't know what it meant. And, and remember, there was a stone that came rolling and knocked it and broke it all to pieces. And remember we said that this statue represented future kingdoms. If you remember the golden head represented Babylon and their empire. They were the rule of the land. Right now in the United States we think we're the ruler of the whole world. Well, back then uh, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, the golden head, they were the rule of the whole world basically. So they were ruled. That was the golden head. But you remember the silver was next. Silver was the chest and the two arms. Think about that for a second. And that was to represent the Persians and the Medes. The Persians and the Medes too. Who is coming to attack Babylon? Just as God had said. It's the Persians and the Medes. Just like God said. Remember that image represented future kingdoms that would be coming after Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians. And that's who's coming to attack the Babylonian kingdom. The Medes and the Persians, just as God had said decades before. That's why there was silk, chest, two arms to represent. It would be ruled by two, two different groups. It would be divided. Remember that word for us, divide. God knows the past. God knows the present. God knows the future. That's why we can trust Him. But wait a minute. You might be sitting there thinking, King Belshazzar was comfortable in the past. There was no way anyone was getting in. Right? Well, King Cyrus of Persia ultimately conquered the city, but he gave it to Darius the Median to help to rule there in Babylon. But here's how he did it. Remember there was water flowing into from the Euphrates River that was coming into Babylon. Well, what they did is they diverted this into a, a lake or a swamp. And then when the water was low, the troops marched through the water, went under the river gates, one on the north side, one on the south, and they were on guard. So they walked right in. But Belshazzar was that confident. And I'm going to show you for just a second what a mighty God that we serve. Turn over to Isaiah chapter 45, verse 1. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 1. If for some reason you're sitting there this morning and you're skeptical, about whether God is real. You're sitting there saying you're not saved and you're sitting out here this morning somebody told you to come or, or whatever, but you're sitting out there and you don't believe that God's real. I want to show you something that will show you that God is real. Uh, that nobody could explain it except that it was a God thing. Isaiah chapter 45, beginning with verse 1. Isaiah chapter 45, beginning with verse 1. I want you to see this passage about the fall of Babylon. God knows everything. And for those who love prophecy, listen to this. Isaiah 45, beginning with verse 1. says, Thus saith the Lord to His anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have hold, to subdue nations before Him, 
And I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two lead gates, and the gate shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. We see that God opened the gates of Babylon for Cyrus to enter. You say, so what? Well, the amazing thing about this passage is that Isaiah wrote it. You say, so what? Well, Isaiah wrote this 200 years before it even happened. So God, through the prophet Isaiah, said that his people would be in captivity in Babylon. What well, happened as God said it would. Secondly, God said that a man named Cyrus would be born. God said that a man named Cyrus would lead the Persians into Babylon. It happened just as God said. The gates of brass that were at the river were broken or unlocked. It happened just as God said. So not only did Isaiah predict that Babylon would fall, but he even named the guy who would take it 200 years before the guy was even born. Before any of it happened. Only God could do that. Only God could do that. It would be like someone here saying that the United States of America was going to fall in the year 2200. And it would be like someone here say, naming the, the country that was going to invade us. It would be like someone here giving the specific name of the leader that would lead this uh, attack. I don't think anyone here could do it. Only God could do something. There are several other passages of Scripture that, that mention Cyrus, that mention the Babylonian captivity, that mentions the Jewish captivity there, it mentions all of this stuff. But God said it, and it happened. Just as he said. And now let's look at verse 30. I'm almost through. Brother. I'm almost through. Verse 30 back to Daniel chapter 5. And it says, In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, that is the Babylonians, slain. Belshazzar is killed. By whom? Cyrus, the Persian king, along with Darius, the Median king. It has all happened just as God said. And man, the Medes and Persian Empire won't last forever either, will it? If you know a little bit about history, if you've read your Bible, if you paid attention, to, as I was talking a few minutes ago, and we know that the Bible was, was correct again. The Bible told us that the next kingdom would be the better. That would be the Greeks. Well, who came on the scene? Alexander the Great. He came and conquered the Persians. Just as the Bible said. Only God knows stuff centuries before it happened. Now someone has said empires do not stand by human mind. Man-made machines and whistles. There is not a wall thick enough nor a wall tall enough to prevent a nation from falling when God pronounces that nation's doom. The party was over. Belshazzar was prideful. He refused to worship the Lord. He was weighed in the balance and he was found one too lacking. He died and he went to hell. What a tragedy. Can you still hear old Danny saying to Belshazzar, You are weighed in the balance and found warning. You are weighed in the balance and found warning. You are weighed in the balance and found warning. Can old Belshazzar still hear that as his soul dropped into hell and is still there centuries later? Church, you are way in the bounces and found one lacking to light. Why? Because when we are awake, when we are judged, when this word of God is placed on this side of the balance, and you and I are over here, we're going to, it's going to be like this when we're compared to God's family. You and I can't do enough. To get to heaven. See, God has a holy standard of righteousness, and you and I cannot meet it on our own. We're lacking. And it's only by the blood of Jesus Christ that we can go to heaven. It's only by the blood of Jesus Christ that you and I can enter into God's presence. I wonder this morning, are you counting on your own efforts like Belshazzar was? Are you thinking that you'll be smart enough, you'll be good enough, you've accumulated enough that you'll be able to get there? That's not how it works. Only by the blood of Jesus Christ. You can get there. Amen? Amen. Yes. Now, 
we come to the close as we prepare for the invitation. The Babylonian kingdom is coming to an end. What will the new regime be like for old day? We'll continue to look at that next week as a very popular uh, Bible story, biblical account, the Daniel and the Lions being is on the horizon. Before the invitation this morning, it does a Christian good to weigh ourselves on God's holy scale against His holy word. Why not do that now? Are you found lacking this morning? As Belshazzar's days were numbered, your days are numbered too. None of us knows exactly when it will be. But everybody in here, our days are numbered. From the smallest, the oldest, and all in between. Your days are numbered. Belshazzar's days were numbered. Your days are numbered. You can consider the writing on the wall. Your days are numbered. You're not going to live forever. You must prepare for eternity. Belshazzar didn't prepare. He lived for the here and now. He loved his wine. He loved his women. He loved his parties. And he's in hell this morning. Regret. Regret. See, Belshazzar, his life ended in tragedy. Yours doesn't have to. Yours doesn't have to. The end of your story, you see, hasn't been written yet. There's still some more chapters that need to be written in your story. As long as you still have breath, as long as your heart is beating, you can bow before the Lord and you can receive Jesus Christ. You can receive Him into your heart and He won't turn you away. If you've never done that, why not do that today? Maybe you're struggling with someone who's gone down the wrong path. Why not come pray for that individual? Pray for wisdom on how to approach that person. Old Daniel took courage for him to go to that king and tell him all that, but he did. He spoke the truth. Pray for God to give you the courage to confront someone who's living in sin. Make sure you deal with your own sin first. We don't go confronting other people's sins when we have our own view. Perhaps this morning you find yourself in a leadership position somewhere, wherever it might be, in the church and work wherever, the leader of your home, or you think for where God has placed you. Are you giving God credit for the success, or are you trying to do that? Why not give God thanks today? Whatever the Lord would have you to do, you do during this time of invitation. Would you bow in prayer with me, please? Father in heaven, we... We thank you for your word. Lord, we, we thank you for this book of Daniel. Lord, we know that we've seen a lot of pride. We've seen a lot of judgment that's occurred. And Lord, sometimes we want to talk about good things. We want to see good things. But, but Lord, that's not always the case. We know that sometimes some things that aren't uh, good, some things that aren't comfortable to us happen through the course of a week and we have to deal with it. And Lord, the examples of Bible characters such as Dan show us how to do it. How to approach situations, how to live. And so Lord, I pray, O oh Holy Spirit, that you go through these aisles up and down, these aisles and up and through the pews, Lord, that you would just speak to our hearts. Lord, we know that we are weak. We know that we are frail. And Lord, you are in control of everything. Our very next breath, our next heartbeat is in your hands. Not in the doctor's hands. Not in our hands in your hands. And Lord, if we should thank you for anything else, why not say, thank you, Lord, for my next breath. Thank you, Lord, for my salvation that I don't have to go to the same place that Belshazzar went. And Lord, should there be someone here who's, who hasn't been living for you, that they're far from you, Lord, I pray for that one nearest hell this morning that needs to come to Jesus. Lord, bless this time of invitation we pray in Jesus' name.
the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in baptism, life unto his death, raised to walk in heaven. Certainly appreciate your being here, appreciate the family and friends being here today to support Taylor and her decision. Uh, let's all stand at this time. And